Good morning, Lin Paul. Good morning, Ajahn Asadro. Thank you for being willing to do another Q&A. So today is uh, Wednesday, May the 3rd, 2023. Today I was wondering if uh, we could explore further a topic that is quite dear to you and that you speak of very nicely, is the first three fetters. Could you describe what they are, please? Yeah, well, for those who aren't acquainted with uh, fetters, there's 10 fetters. This is in the Pali Canon. <clears throat> and the first three fetters are uh, the opening to the path, the stream enterer. And these first three fetters are uh, obstructions and obstacles to seeing the path, having insight into the way of liberation and freedom. And so, and they're human made fetters. They're, it's about ego, the, the human ego, about cultural conditioning, social conditioning, and about uh, language, thinking, and words. <clears throat> so in exploring these kind of first three fetters is very important because the following fetters, the seven after that, are more or less, if you're aware of the path, then you can uh, have insight into the relinquishment, letting go of, of just the natural condition of the human state, the sexual desires of the body and the, and the survival instincts that we strongly identify with. Uh, we begin to see them in a non-personal way rather than in the personal way of the ego. So the ego is the first fetter, and it uh, tend, it's uh, created with with words. We because we're thinking creatures, and we have language, then we create the sense of ourself as a separate person, as a man or woman, as uh, black or white. We identify with. Them what the body looks like, young or old, and uh, the ego is formed through this sense of defining ourselves with languages. So language is, is an acquired trait, you know, you're not born speaking any language. And it's, uh, there are different languages, but they're all created by human beings who are trying to describe the conditioned world that we experience through through the senses, through the body, uh, and, and through the lifetime of an individual human being. So the, this um, first fetter is to be reflected upon by witnessing, is not trying to get rid of the ego, or stop thinking. You know, it's not a nihilistic approach, but an understanding one in which you begin to witness how you create yourself through thoughts. And just the simple I am is a statement of being present. And, and then that I am becomes, I am Ajahn Sumedho, I am a Buddhist monk, I am, and, and you know, then the adjectives and the nouns follow accordingly. So, <clears throat> and um, by listening to your ego, by witnessing it, so this practice, this direct practice that the Buddha 
uh, taught or pointed to is is being a witness to the ego, not the critic, not the uh, to see the suffering of attachment to these views about oneself, and so that we begin to let go of the ego. We still have an ego, but we're no longer limited by our egos and defined by our egos. So I encourage the practice of witnessing by intentionally thinking, just thinking your own name. I am Bob, or I am Bill, or I am Sharon. Uh, all these, these, these are thoughts, uh, not, not about being right or wrong, but we can witness them. We can actually observe and listen to our minds saying what we are through this limitation of language. And so the ego is very limited condition because it it changes according to so many other conditions and uh, and creates a, a sense of separation, isolation, loneliness, uh, and identification with co other conditions that uh, we tend to make value judgments about whether they're right or wrong, good or bad, true or false. So this is to be witnessed to rather than judged. To judge our ego, to say it's good or bad, right or wrong, is the function of language. It's discriminatory ability to think about what's good, what's bad, uh, and define things according to what we've been conditioned to believe in, what is right, what is wrong. And we, uh, we become very attached to our views. So you can witness so many problems in society and family life and religion is this sense of I'm right and, and you're wrong because this, this divides experience into two opposites and two extremes which tend to you know we tend to cling to one and resist the other we're not witnessing when we're judging we're trying to control things and make everything right and good or what we want it to be uh, by making judgments and trying to annihilate its opposite. But in witnessing, you're not, it's not annihilating wrong or, or right or any, or not having any view at all, but being the, the, uh, benevolent witness that realizes all conditions, whether they're right or wrong, are conditions our illusions, our artifices that we can let go of. We, we're, we're not limiting ourselves to those that bind us to the limitations that we attach to. And the second letter is about... Sorry to interrupt, but just before you uh, address the second letter, may I have just asked something about the first one? Yes. Because you mentioned it's not a question of getting rid of it, annihilating it. What's the relationship then that we have to in functioning in daily life? How would you describe the relationship to this sense of personality, this ego, which is there? We don't get rid of it, and yet it's there. So what's its function? Well, when we trust in awareness, that's our refuge. Then in daily life, in the, in the, through the living in a conditioned form, such as your own body, then you can see your actions are from spontaneity, which is appropriate action. Uh, according to the situation. 
It's not fixed in time or in belief. So spontaneity comes from the, the nature of Dhamma, of, of just being a, uh, responding to a situation without just being caught in conditioned views about it's right or wrong. But life is, you know, the ability to be spontaneous. It's not, you can't, you can't make yourself spontaneous as an act of will, even though we, we can say, I want to be a spontaneous person. Uh, that's another thought pattern, another ego trip. But spontaneity comes through trusting in Dhamma or in abiding in awareness in which we respond to contingencies according to what's necessary. And that's wisdom, because then wisdom is guiding us. Universal wisdom is, is able to allow us to act in, uh, in responsive ways according to the, the situation of the moment. Thank you. So the second letter yes. is about attachment to conditioning. And uh, this can be cultural, religious, social, political uh, conditioning that we acquire. And so we're not born with any view about being Christian or Buddhist or Hindu or anything like that. We, these are acquired conditions that we tend to uh, identify with and believe in. <clears throat> so just like Buddhism itself is, is a condition, a religious condition, uh, because it has a scripture and, uh, you know, it's an ancient tradition, has tradition and a belief system. We can believe in, in Buddhism and uh, be culturally Buddhist, uh, being brought up in a Buddhist country with Buddhist parents and you're identified as a Buddhist or Christian or Muslim, and when you, this is a cultural conditioning, religious conditioning, it's like being an American is, you're brought up with American values and American ideas. It's conditioned into you. They're not ultimately real or true, and they're part of a cultural identity that we, we tend to be blindly operating from, like patriotism, nationalism is, is you know, how we, we, we take sides our, about our beliefs, what we believe in. We attach to beliefs in religion about God, or we can believe there isn't any God. We can believe anything in the flying spaghetti monster <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, the, any kind of ridiculous proposition, some people will believe in it. And, uh, and oftentimes we, you know, from our innocent years and childhood, we're conditioned to believe in what our parents tell us uh, and and we we don't you know we aren't aware of belief as a as a something that is artificial, but we tend to be willing to die for our beliefs. As we grow older, we'll sacrifice our life for righteousness and and truth and noble causes. But being a witness to cultural social religious conditioning this it's not as i said before with the ego it's not about judging it but observing it like the very perception of i am a buddhist 
is 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 a condition that I can see is is acquired and uh, and identify with the tradition with a religious tradition then I'm identified with Theravada tradition I'm identified with the Thai forest tradition uh, I'm identified with Lumpur Cha uh, I, and these are all very good identities <clears throat> but the attachment the belief in 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 uh, that I am uh, a Buddhist is an artificial convention that one can see with w wisdom as is a condition that arises and ceases an acquired identity acquired sense of right or wrong or better or worse so the witnessing is just aware of Better is like this, worse is like this. Being Buddhist, identifying with Buddhism is like this. And in this way, uh, it's noticing just the, the, uh, the reaction that one emotionally has to be identified with nationality, with race, with, uh, with appearance, with religion, with nationality with patriotism and just not denying these things or judging them but observing that when we identify with something that that divides reality then we're we're in conflict with its opposite so uh, we see the suffering we have when we're you know how we can even in, in the Buddhist world, take sides with Hinayana, Theravada, Tibetan, and uh, feel the opposites are wrong or inferior. And, uh, and that is out of ignorance, that's out of conditioning, that's not out of wisdom. When wisdom operates, a spontaneity, spontaneity is our way of living our lives. We can respond to situations with our traditions, with our nationality, with our religious conditioning in suitable ways that aren't divisive or, or limiting. How do you propose to explore the areas of one's life which we tend to identify with? Because you give a few examples, but then there's some that are maybe also embedded in our a sense of identity, such as being a child or a parent, a brother, a mem member of a community in society, our position in relationship to work, colleagues, or how do you propose for when we're not yet aware of these and we don't have the ability to step back and realize we're identifying with something in particular, do you have any suggestions about how we can explore this area so that it reveals the things that we might be attaching to in terms of conditioning and identity? Well, it's, it's like these are conventions, being brother and sister, mother and father, and they, they have their function. So, uh, you know, you realize you're, you're if I just identify him being as a brother or a father or even a man, then uh, that, that's a limited identity. When you let go of the, all your identities, uh, uh, then you know, the universal reality itself, you know, it's, it's freedom. Where having to be a father, you you have certain responsibilities, you're a good father or an absent father or a religious father or a bad father and and these are you know conventions that we we can that are can be useful if they're understood with wisdom 
So being a, a Buddhist monk, for example, is uh, is an identity that you know I can if I'm attached to being a Buddhist monk, and that's my identity that I limit myself with, then I'm judging the rest of the world by my attachment to Theravada Buddhist rules and precepts. And, uh, and it also it makes me, it limits me in how I respond to life. I just tend to react. I get caught in reactions as the limitations we place ourselves with cause reactions to when somebody attacks Theravada Buddhism, then you get angry. And or you try to, you feel, uh, is it the lesser vehicle or? And you know, you can see that a lesser vehicle makes it sound inferior or the greater vehicle or the ultimate vehicle. These are words about, you know, what is the best or superior or inferior. And if I'm attached to being a Theravada Buddhist monk and somebody says it's inferior, that attachment forces me to get angry and upset and argumentative. And uh, just like being attached to being masculine, then uh, being attached to masculinity, then seeing that the feminist movement is an enemy because my limitation is a masculinity and, and femininity is its opposite. So femininity becomes the enemy. Or, uh, you know, and I just see how being on the political system of, of the left or the right and how being attached to being on the right side of the political spectrum sees the liberal left as a, as a dangerous and enemy and destructive and vice versa as a, attached to the left and I see the right as evil and bad because that's what attachment does you know you like with Christianity for example they uh, they tend they tend to think they're the only way by attachment to Christian doctrine then they see it see Buddhism and all other religions as evil there's that kind of and that's a natural reaction to to being attached to conventions, blindly attached to beliefs and conventions. And being a witness to that, you begin to see it, the suffering you create by hating, by looking down on others, by resenting, feeling inferior, like racial tensions, being black or white, you know, you can you can see how limiting that is when you realize your true nature is, isn't limited by the color of your skin. And, and you know, you're not, you're not just a, a black person or a white person or a man or woman or a feminist or a macho male, that these are belief systems we've acquired out of ignorance out of non-attention, non-awareness. They've been inculcated into us, instilled, conditioned into us when we're quite usually quite innocent or ignorant of life. So the Buddha, you know, Buddha was his teaching are pointing to investigating experience. Am I really this physical body? Am I really you know, what is my nationality? Now, I'm, I'm a British citizen. Am I British or American? Or, you know, these are, can be questions that we can, where do I fit in? Where do I belong? Is a, is a common doubt in people's minds with miscegenation, with intermarriage between races. What race is somebody who's 
mother is black and father is white. And you know, it's a, you know, where, what if we're limited to black and white and racial views, then you know that that binds us to a, to one extreme that sees the other as as uh, the enemy. But when we let go of these prejudices, these biases, then we begin to feel a sense of oneness, of wholeness and completeness, and a sense of compassion for, for the suffering of others, uh, and, and kind of unconditional love of, of all creatures comes through this universal wisdom insight that is not limited where all the like the ego is a limitation the, the culture social religious conditioning is limitation and then the third pattern is is about doubt and when you investigate doubt which is one of the main fetters in religious life, in Buddhism, uh, you know, when you're meditating and, and you're encouraged to meditate, be mindful, and you're given a, a method to use, and, and you're given instruction on how to attain samadhi or concentration, and then, then one of the big obstructions to one-pointed concentration is doubt. And how does doubt arise? Through thinking. Th thinking, attachment to thoughts and ideas and positions and ideals creates a doubt. Why does the world have to be like this? Why can't we all just get along? Why can't human, human beings love each other? These are the, oftentimes doubts. And why, why, why does God allow these wars like in Ukraine and, and in Sudan? And why does, uh, you know, and you look at the history of human civilization, it's all about war and murder and killing and power. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, how, how does a loving God, an almighty God who's filled with love, allow, make, create uh, such a, a, a brutal society? And, and uh, nature itself, where we have to live off each other, on living creatures, whether they be animals or vegetables. You know, so, if, you know, when you etherealize God to the position of, you know, of perfect love in a, in a love defined by an ignorant mind, then why, why does God allow this misery to take place? And, um, and because this is doubt, this is thinking. And so we can say there's no God, God doesn't care, or uh, there isn't any God to, uh, in creation is we can be this glorious, it's a magical, wonderful experience. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's horrible. And I, and I imagine that citizens of Ukraine, you know, they're in a nice country like that are experiencing the horror of fear and bombing and destruction and the young soldiers both on both sides on russia russian soldiers who well are ukrainian soldiers experience horror and fear and death and and destruction in very tangible ways it's not just neurotic fears of nothing why does why why is that why is that happening why can't we just get along and so we we anguish over these doubts and uh, 
about ourselves. Why am I, you know, about our uh, religious attainments? About politics and, and everything. Thinking creates doubt. As long as one's caught in, in uh, abiding in thinking, then there's going to be doubt as a, as a result. Unless you bind yourself to very rigid beliefs that don't allow doubt. So some religions, doubt is a sin. To doubt God is a sin. It's, it's evil and it's the evil forces tempting you to doubt. But when you investigate doubt, it's, it's all about attachment to thinking, to ideas, to beliefs. And so just doubting God, for example, is, is, you know, God is a belief. You believe in God, but what is God? You know, and this is to be investigated, not to say God doesn't exist or there isn't any God or there is, or it's a Christian God, and Buddhism doesn't have any God, and I'm like, these are conventions. But there are also words about belief in something or, or uh, the limitation of cultural identities like Buddhist uh, religious terms are very different from Christian ones. So either who's right and who's wrong. And so we get caught in doubt when we just see the, the words of our religious beliefs. But when we're the witness to thinking, then we can see the limitation of thinking. And that's getting transcending doubt through wisdom, through seeing things as they are, that that all doubt, all words, all thoughts, all languages are creations, their sankaras, their conditions, their phenomena, they arise and cease like any other condition. So we, and this is wisdom, to know this for yourself. And through this kind of exploration of the first three pleasures, by, by not trying to define them, but to explore them. What is the ego? What is cultural conditioning, social conditioning? What is thinking? And when you think about thinking, you're caught in the trap. But you don't have to think about it. You can witness. You know you're thinking. It's like this. And words, you know, they're easy to see. Like just the personal pronoun in English, I, is one letter. And you can, can you sustain I as a conti continuum? You know, it's, it, it's just one vowel in the, in the alphabet that we can think. And when we intentionally think I, we're not worth thinking that. Thinking is like this, it's a creation, a habit that we've been, we've acquired from after we're born, you know, we acquired in the, through the conditioning of our family and education. The way you speak about these three fetters uh, kind of reminds me of something that transpires frequently in the Buddha's teachings, like when he's talking about the Noble Eightfold Path, he talks about these eight factors, but they really all come together as one path. And the way you address this topic of the three fetters, it seems like thinking is very central to all three of these fetters. 
Oh, it is. It's all, you know, they like, Buddhism is a word. Christianity, Christianity, God is a word. There isn't any God or words. And when you, when you're witnessing words, you know, they, they affect you emotionally. So words, uh, you know, have, and you can be the witness to it when we think of um, the word love. It's a word, four letter word. And we, and we, and what does it emotionally bring up? You know, and it, people talk about unconditioned love. What is that? Or romantic love? So in my generation, I was brought up, you know, in, in, on Hollywood films about it's all romantic love. So for me, the word love was always about romance. But that, but is that, but that's the limitation I, I had to being conditioned by Hollywood movies of the 40s and 1940s. And so expanding that, you know, when Buddhists talk about metta or loving kindness or various meditation teachers talk about unconditioned love. What is unconditioned love? And so, you, you know, these are words, but the word love itself, what, how does it affect you when you think of it? Or the, the four letter words you're not supposed to say in public. Or, you know, how do they affect you when you, when you hear, when, uh, when a woman hears uh, uh, a, dis a, a man disparaging women, it's like this. You know, they know what they're feeling. And that knowing, it's not judgmental, it's, it's, you know, you can't help the way you feel. You know, and coming to live in England as a Buddhist monk, wearing a robe and a shaven head and people call you Hare Krishna or Gandhi. These are the good terms. <laughs> or they call you skinhead. You know, how do you feel when when you you know in Thailand you're respected and in London you're called a skinhead and obscene gestures are made to you you know it's if you see it personally it's very offensive and you get very you know you can be offended and hurt and angry <clears throat> or if you're just witnessing then it doesn't mean you don't feel offended but being offended is is not your attachment. You're not holding on to being a, a offended by the action of somebody else. You're liberated. Because somebody who's not a Buddhist, who lives in London, sees a Buddhist monk walking on the street in London and has a reaction. What who's that weirdo or strange person? What are they? You know, other people think that they're Hare Krishna, or they're the Dalai Lama, or you know. So you know, these are these are very nice terms, <laughs> but, but skinhead is rather contemptuous, or you know, a freeloader off the society. And how, how we're, you know, many people see us through very negative, judgmental thoughts and ideas. But you can't help that, you know, you can't, you don't, you, you know, when you expect people to respect you, because then you're in for trouble. Because some people 
don't know what you're doing and you look strange and it's like this. So this liberation is through, through trusting in awareness and learning from life as you experience it as an individual, as a Buddhist monk on the streets of London or in Bangkok or wherever. You know, you're not, if you're used to being respected in Bangkok and you're disrespected in London, <clears throat> Both can be egotistical, egotistical trips. You know, I, you should respect me because I'm a Buddhist monk, a holy man. And, 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 and in Thailand, it, it, you get a lot of respect for this, for being a holy man. But can you expect that in London or Paris or New York? You know, then you're witnessing and you're learning how to, to learn from being disrespected, how to let go of the, uh, the feelings of, of fear or of being offended. So it doesn't mean you don't feel offended, but you're witnessing being offended and that's different. When I'm attached to, how dare you offend me, then I become indignant and feel, you know, that, that they're wrong, they're bad, they shouldn't be doing that. That's my karma. I make value judgments about others. Karma. <laughs> Whether they respect me or not. <laughs> And that's suffering. You know, we suffer when we, when we uh, do that. And identity is, you know, you just listening to the news, the media, and you know, like the identities people have now. You know, there's conventional identities of husband and wife and child and brother and sister and male and female. And these are, these are the conventions that have been normal conventions for years. But now there's like trans children, like in the news this morning about trans children, uh, and and that's something a, a new perception in the mind and in, and an identity that most of us never thought of before. So it's a challenge. Or gay or lesbian. These are words that you know you, you, that, that are very strong people strongly identify with. And and then uh, people form opinions about right or wrong about these 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 terminologies because what is considered right and normal is you know is is our standard for judging everything that doesn't fit into the limitation of those words and so uh, you know we feel offended or angry or want to annihilate or get rid of what is evil or wrong and in our and with wisdom we can witness that if we feel offended or angry or feel that that these new identities are these these person identities and conditions are wrong, we can be aware that, that feeling something's wrong is like this. And it's not judging it, it's just witnessing your own emotional re reaction to, to the word gay or lesbian or trans. And, and, you, and this witnessing is liberation. 
where the limiting of oneself to these identities is a form of bondage. So you, you can see for yourself, you can realize that the, the, how, how frightening limitation is by just the way we're conditioned by society, by religion, you know, then there's a lot to fear. And, you know, because fear of the devil, fear of evil, fear of bad karma, fear of making mistakes, fear of being caught, being a criminal, being a drug addict, and all these things, you know, the, the whole realm of binding oneself to limitation is the realm of fear. So, you know, samsara is a frightening experience. If you're, if you're limiting yourself to, to, the, to the conditions that we experience through the, through the mind and through the body. Thank you very much for this reflection.